Before we begin, I have a very special and important announcement, and I want you to listen carefully. Our organization, Torch, is a nonprofit, meaning that the only way we can pay for our expenses, the only way we could support our team of five rabbis and rebbitsons, our support staff, pay rent, and do all the wonderful work of Torch and all the amazing podcasts, the only way we could do that is via the generosity of our friends and our supporters. That's the only way we can pay for our expenses. And our organization has a philosophy that we don't try to fundraise every day of the year. We try to compress a year's worth of fundraising into one week. In one week, we try to raise the bulk of our operating expenses, and that week is right now. You appreciate our work. You enjoy our podcasts. You find our offerings to be interesting and educational and valuable and compelling. We need your support to keep it going. So today... I'm asking you for your friendship and support and generosity and asking you to visit givetorch.org and make a donation to our organization. The link is in the description, givetorch.org. And to sweeten the deal, every donation will be tripled. A $100 donation will equal $300 for Torch. A $1,000 donation will equal a $3,000 donation to Torch. So give what you can give and amplify your donation and help make the campaign a success. If everyone who is listening right now gives what they can give, the campaign will be a success and Torch will be bright for another year. Without your support, I wouldn't be making podcasts. Torch would fold. I'd be selling mortgages or cabinets or work in healthcare or, I don't know, become a lawyer. But thanks to our supporters... Torch is teaching and spreading Torah and Jewish wisdom and the rich Jewish heritage on a never-before-seen scale. Just via the podcast in 2020, we merited to do 162 new episodes, almost a half a million downloads, perennially listed on the top charts of the category of Judaism on iTunes. And I want to stress, that accomplishment is not mine. It's not even the accomplishment of the great team at Torch. That is the handiwork of all of you who supported our organization. Us together, we accomplished that goal. In our eyes here at Torch, our donors are really our investors. Whatever merit we get from the unprecedented amount of Torah that we spread, it's divided between us, the team at Torch, and the donors slash investors who support our work. So please pause this podcast and visit GiveTorch.org and give what you can give to support Torch and to support the podcasts. This is an online fundraiser. It's a matching fundraiser. Every donation will be tripled. There's a link in the description of this podcast. So I'm asking you to please pause the podcast and visit GiveTorch.org and support Torch and support the podcasts. Now, I know from previous years that some of the listeners will say, you know what, Rabbi, you convinced me. And they're going to come out of the woodwork and support the campaign when I make the annual appeal. They're going to pause the episode, go to givetorch.org, and give what they can give. But many of y'all are not going to be convinced. And they're going to say, oh no, the rabbi's doing his annual promo. He's doing his annual appeal. When will I finally get to the actual content of the episode that I want to listen to? And they're going to skip 30 seconds ahead. Oh, he's still doing it. Skip another 30 seconds ahead. Oh, when is this going to end? So every year, I try to persuade even the skeptics that supporting Torch is a very worthy cause. And how am I going to persuade you this year? Well, this year, I'm doing something unprecedented and probably something a bit foolish. I may very well regret this. This may be a terrible idea, but let's give it a shot. If you need help, being convinced to support Torch at givetorch.org, pull out your phone, go to your contacts, type in the name Yakov Wolby, that's me, the email address you already know, rabbiwolby.com, and you put in the phone number 713-301-3611, 713-301-3611, and then you go to your messaging app, and you send me a text, with the words, I need to be persuaded. 
And I will call you up and I will personally persuade you to support Torch at givetorch.org. This is very important to me. I really would love to have 100% participation of the podcast audience. I view the podcast audience as a big distributed family. And I want everyone on board to support this campaign. If you've never given to Torch, this is a fantastic time to do it. Give what you can give. If you already are part of our donor slash investor class, push yourself to give a little more. You will not regret it. Partner with me. Give what you can. 2021, you're going to be on Team Wolby, on Team Torch, Team Spreading Torah, and our rich Jewish heritage throughout the world. Support the Parsha Podcast. Support the Jewish History Podcast. Support Torah 101. Support This Jewish Life. Support the Mitzvah Podcast. Support the Ethics Podcast. Support all the wonderful, fantastic work of Torch. I know it's hard, but this is worth it. Push yourself and give what you can give at givetorch.org. You won't regret it. A few practical things. You can donate via PayPal. If you prefer to send a check, email me and I'll make it easier for you. We started accepting Bitcoin and other crypto via Coinbase. And in fact, we've already gotten several Bitcoin donations. But you'll need to email me to set that up. We'll do it. Rabbilwajima.com. Take care of it. If I have your phone number, I plan on giving you a call this week to solicit your support for this campaign. So be on the lookout for that. You could choose which podcast to support, which Torch teams to support. There's all kinds of cool sponsorship opportunities. You could support the Torch podcast microphone and studio. You could dedicate your favorite Torch podcast. You could sponsor an episode. Every donation of $360 or more will receive a signed copy of my upcoming book, Upon a 10-Stream Tarp, which is set to be released in the coming months. All that on givetorch.org. The link is in the description. Thank you for another amazing year of Torch Podcasts. I am eternally grateful to you for your support and your friendship throughout the years. Thank you for listening. Please, God, the campaign will be a smashing success. And Torch will have another fabulous year. And then about a year from now, next March, we're going to have another tough business meeting, another annual appeal. And that's the only appeal you're going to hear from me for the next year. So thank you for listening. And now, enjoy the podcast. We are up to mitzvah number 71, and today we'll do 71, 395, 473, and 474, and 507. And again, this numbering system follows the mitzvahs as they appear in the Torah. The Torah has 630 mitzvahs, and we are going through them in order, in the order in which they appear in the Torah. And today we're going to bunch together five related mitzvahs, number 71, 395, 473, 474, and 507. And these are the mitzvahs of tithing. We're told that when we have produce from the year, we have to give various tithes. There are tithes that go to the Kohen. There are tithes that go to the Levite. There are tithes that we eat ourselves in Jerusalem. There are tithes that go to the poor person. And finally, the fifth mitzvah, and that is that we have to follow a designated order, a protocol of how to give the tithes and what the order of the tithe giving is. And those are the mitzvahs that we want to do today. Now, as always, we're going to do just a sampling of some of the laws and some of the insights behind this mitzvah. If you do the math, the amount of mishnah, that deals with the laws of tithing is about 5% of all of Mishnah. So there is a vast amount of literature on this subject, but we're going to try and get a sample, a snapshot of the mitzvah to gain some literacy, as we always try to do here, on the uh, the mitzvah. So let's start with mitzvah 507, which is the truma to the Kohen. So you have your year's crops, and you have to disperse the tithes before you can eat the food. And from a Torahitic level, the tithes are oriented around a farmer. You produce wheat, or you plant wheat, or barley, or whatever it is. And 
after a year's worth of work, you finally reap your harvest and you have to disperse the tithes before you can eat the food. Before the food is tithed, it's called untithed or tevel, and thus it is prohibited to eat. So the first tithe that has to be given out is the truma to the kohen, to the priest. And this, in fact, is one of the 24 gifts that are given to the kohen. It's a great gig if you could get it. A kohen is given all kinds of gifts from the Israelites. And one of them is that they get the truma, the first tithing, is given to the Kohen. Now the Rambam points out that of the 24 gifts that are given to the Kohen, many of them are the first. So the first of your fruits, the first fruits, the Bikurim, you give to the Kohen. The first of your produce, of your crops, you give to the Kohen. When you make a dough, you give the Chala to the Kohen, the first, the beginning. The first shearing of wool you give to the Kohen. There's three parts of all sacrifices that are given to the Kohen. The cheek and the right foreleg and the, and the stomach. And the Raman points out that the, each one of these are the, the first of its kind. The first step that it takes. The first part of its face. The first part of the digestion system of the animal. All the first are given to the Kohen. And he explains that when you work hard, and you produce something. That first thing, it's almost like you go to a store and they work so hard and they get all the certification and they do all the regulation and finally they open up their restaurant and someone comes in and buys something and you have a dollar bill. And you take that dollar bill and you plaster it on the wall. It's kind of a strange thing. You go to a restaurant, you see they have the first dollar that we earn because there's some immense pride that people have when they put in effort and it yields results and that very first result is something that they have this deep, intimate connection with. And we're told that the first fruits, the first of your crops, the first shearing, that joy, you channel it to God. And therefore you give that first to his representative, and that is the Kohen. So you produce your crops, and you are done, and now it's time to harvest. The first tithing you give is the truma, and you give that to the Kohen. Well, how much do you have to give? What percentage of that? Tithe usually means 10%. In this context, the truma is not 10%. It's 2%. We'll get to the 10% in a little bit. 2% you give to the Kohen. Now, the Mishnah tells us that 2% is 1 50th, and that's average. The average truma is 2%. If you want to be very generous, you could give one fortieth to the coin. And if you want to be a little bit more skimpy, a little bit more miserly, you give one sixtieth to the coin. But the bare minimum, the absolute minimum, is even one kernel. If you have an entire field and you take one kernel of wheat and you give that to the coin, of course it's not advised. Average is two percent. But that is the bare minimum. It means you have to give something. As long as the first gift that you give, it could be the tiniest amount. You give that to the coin and you have fulfilled your obligation. But, of course, we are told that you're supposed to give around 2% on average. If you want to be a little bit more generous, 1 40th. Now, from a biblical perspective, the laws of truma apply only to grain, wine, and oil. Rabbinically, anything that grows from the ground, anything that is human food, anything that the owner watches is obligated in truma. But from a biblical perspective, it's only the three of grain, wine, and oil. And the Sefer Chinuch, the book that we're using to guide us through the mitzvot, he explains that these are the essentials. The essentials are grain, wine, and oil. And therefore, from a biblical perspective, it's important for someone to take the things that are essential to them and the first, and you dedicate that, you consecrate that to God and to his emissaries. And therefore he explains that what's really happening over here is a person is supposed to, at the moment of their great joy, at their moment of their great pride, they've produced a, a, a yield. There's been crops. There's been something that 
is now the product, the fruits of their labor, at that moment, don't forget about God. Don't forget about his emissaries and consecrate that, that first little bit of your produce, consecrate that for God. And therefore, if you do only one kernel, you are already engaging in that exercise and you've already fulfilled the bare basic obligation. But the Almighty wants us to really have this idea, penetrate home, to really think about the fact that all the blessings that I have are really from God and the first of my fruits I'm supposed to dedicate towards him. And therefore, I say to say, you're supposed to give a minimum of 2%. If you want to be a little bit cheaper, it's 1 60th. A little bit more generous, it is 1 40th. You give it to the coin, and now it belongs to the coin. And what does the coin do with those products, with that crop? Well, they can eat it. But there's a whole set of laws governing how the Kohen eats it. It is what's called holy food. An Israelite is not allowed to eat it. In fact, by Torah law, if an Israelite eats truma, they are liable to be executed in the eyes of God. Of course, it's not something that the, Jew, that the Jewish court, the human court, meets out. But in God's eyes, it is an executable offense. You give it to the Kohen and you have fulfilled your first tithing the truma to the Kohen. Now, which Kohen gets it? What if you live in a city and there's hundreds of Kohanim? Which Kohen gets your truma? The answer is, it's your choice. You could give to any Kohen in the entire world. It's up to you. You as the Israelite, you have the right to decide which Kohen receives your truma. And the Talmud points out that there's room for some chicanery here. You could have a Kohen who says, I want to volunteer in your threshold. I want to volunteer as a farmhand on your field. I want to help you. And of course, he's trying to lobby you that you give your truma to him. After all, you have to give it to a Kohen. So why not me? I'm going to be the one who volunteers in your field. And therefore, the Talmud says that a Kohen is not allowed to go and help or to get paid in truma. It's a really bad look for a Kohen to do work in exchange for the truma. It's supposed to be a gift given to the Kohen. It's not supposed to be, it's not supposed to be a transactional. It's supposed to be entirely out of the goodness of your heart. 2% to the Kohen. Okay, so you've given your 2% to the Kohen. What now? Now you have the first tithe. And in this instance, it is 10%. 10% not to the Kohen but to the Levite. Of course, a Kohen is a member of the tribe of Levi, but they're a family amongst the tribe of Levi, the family of Aaron, and Aaron and his descendants exclusively, they're not part of the general, they're almost designated as a separate group amongst the Levites. When you give the 10%, the first tithing goes to the Levites and not to the Kohen. And the Torah tells us, that when they divided up the land of Israel, every tribe got a portion, with the exception of the tribe of Levi. God is their portion. They don't have land designated for them in the land of Israel. But when all of the other Israelites plant their fields and produce their crops, they give 10% to the Levite. And the commentaries here explain that the Levites, they represent the clergy. They're the ones who are always doing the bidding of the people, the spiritual bidding of the people. They are representing the nation. They are doing the work in the temple. And therefore, it's important for us, the Israelites, to sustain them with with dignity. They, after all, don't have a portion but everyone else is going to cover their expenses. And therefore, it's important for us as Israelites to pay for the Levites' expenses, and therefore we we designate 10% of all of our produce to be given to the Levite. And the commentaries ask an interesting question. Well, 
the Levites are one tribe out of 12. And therefore, if it's fair, they don't have a portion of the land. And therefore, we have to give them from our portion. But shouldn't we give them one twelfth of our crops, not one tenth? After all, they're one twelfth, they're one tribe out of twelve. So we should give them not ten percent, but eight point three 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 percent, which is the equivalent of one twelfth of a hundred percent. Why are we giving them extra? So the Sefer Chinuch explains. He says, "You're right. Mathematically, they deserve only eight point three because they don't have a portion of the land of Israel, and therefore there is something that they deserve. But they're the Levites. These are the holiest people of our nation. This is the tribe that has designated themselves for worship of God, and we give them a little bit extra. And not only do they get 10%, they don't have to pay for any of the expenses, they just get free and clear 10% of all the crops of all the wealth, of all the bounty produced by all of Israel. And the Sefer Chanukh tells us that if someone gives life and gives support to those who are God's emissaries, who are God's representatives, who are the clergymen, who are the Levites, there is a promise from God that they are going to have divine blessing. And he quotes a Mishnah, Ma'aser, which is tithing, that's a way to ensure that you get wealthy. And he quotes the famous Talmud. The Talmud says that in all areas, we cannot test God. We have to just rely on him. We have to have faith. But there's one area we're allowed to test God. Aser, ta'aser, you should surely tithe, says the Talmud. What that means is you should tithe in order that you should become wealthy. And this is the only area we're allowed to test God. Every other area, you have to rely on faith. Now, I would be remiss if I did not mention the very famous Rambam, where he talks about the Levites. And he asks the question, why are the Levites different? Why don't they have a portion in the land of Israel? Why don't they get part of the booty, part of the plunder of the conquest of Israel? And he explains, because they were designated to worship God and to be teachers, to teach Torah and laws to the masses. And therefore, they are removed, they are designated from the rest of the people. They don't engage in warfare, they don't inherit any of the land, and they do not earn, so to speak, with their own strength. Rather, they are the army of God. And then the Ramam continues. And this is not limited to the tribe of Levite. Rather, every human, he doesn't say Jew, he says every human of all the people in the world whose heart is inspired and understands of their knowledge to designate themselves and to stand before God, to worship God, to serve, to be of service of God, and they go in a straight path the way the Almighty wants, and they remove from their neck the yoke of any other calculation besides for the will of God, behold, this person becomes consecrated in the highest level of holiness. And God is their portion, and God is their inheritance, and they will merit both in this world and in the next world. They, in this world, will be taking care of God like the Levites and the Kohanim. And of course, their reward is complete for them in the world to come. I know this is a very controversial subject, but the moral and religious argument to exempt yeshiva students from the army is this idea. We are told about a tribe that's designated for God, and that is their job. And because that's their job, the responsibilities, the other earthly terra firm responsibilities are removed from them, and consequently, Everyone else has to take care of them. And therefore, they're not responsible to go to war. And our responsibility as Israelites is to uphold them and to sustain them. Now, unlike the truma given to the Kohen, the 10% tithing given to the Levite is not holy. It can be eaten by all, provided that the Levite actually gives his tithing. And this is where it gets a little confusing. We give 2% to the Kohen, and we give 10% to the Levite. 
And the Levite himself has to give 10% of his 10% to the Kohen. But once the Levite has tithed from his tithing, that food is completely permissible to anyone, even to regular Israelites, unlike the Truma, which can only be eaten by the Kohen and his family and his household. So some more laws over here that are very pertinent. You can only confer tithing from produce unto produce of the same year and the same type. So if I have wheat and barley, I can't give 10% of the entirety of all the grain and cover the tithing. I have to give 10% of the barley for the barley, 10% of the wheat for the wheat, etc. Moreover, it follows a fiscal year system. The bounty, the, the product, the yield of this year covers the yield for this year. I cannot tithe from something old on this year, something new on last year etc. Now, when does something become tithable? This is very complicated laws. There's various different stages. When something becomes edible, when something becomes processed, when something is harvested, and the final stage of the development of the fruit to make it tithable is when you actually bring it into your house. And when you bring it into your house, all the laws of tithing actually apply. And there's no way to avoid tithing before you can consume it. Whereas in earlier stages of the development of the fruit, you can take a snack before you tithe it. It's not fully consecrated as being primed for tithing. Now, the Talmud gives an interesting loophole, which when I was researching this, I was like, oh, I remember studying that like 15 years ago because it is so surprising and so interesting. It's kind of hard to forget. It's quite memorable. The final stage of making something tithable is when it sees the face of the house, which means it comes into the house. You bring your grain into the granary, you bring it to your house, and now it's yours, and you're going to eat some of it, you're going to sell some of it. You've completed all the work needs to be done in the field, everything has been completed, and now it's indoors. But the way it's described is that it sees the face of the house. It enters the threshold. It it crosses over from outside the house to inside the house. So the Talmud says that there's a loophole. If you have a skylight, if you have a hole in your roof, and you take your grain, and you don't bring it into the house, into the door, but you drop it through the roof. It never crosses over the threshold. And therefore, it would actually not be obligated to be tithed. So there's a loophole. It's like you could set up your seed corp in like Bermuda. You've heard of those things? The whole company runs from some P.O. box in Ireland or something like that. Apparently, there's loopholes here for tithing as well. If someone wants to follow this loophole, they could do it. But the Torah tells us, the Torah warns us, that in the event that someone refuses to give the tithing, even if they do it in a kosher fashion, they will end up with the tithing. The verse says that you have 100%, 100 units, and you don't give 10% to the Levite, you want to use all this chicanery, all these loopholes to avoid giving it, you will end up with that 10%, but you're going to lose the other 90%. So it's a great loophole, but it's probably bad advice. Now, if a Levite owns a field, they too are obligated to tithe. They must give to a different Levite. They are not exempt from tithing. So those are the first two tithings that we have to give. The Truma, 2% to the Kohen. The Miser, the first tithing, which is 10% to the Levite. There's at least two more tithings that we need to talk about on this same crops. Because, of course, there's tithing for animals and there's all kinds of tithing. But we're talking about specifically the tithing for produce. The next tithing is what's called the second tithing. Another 10%. And that's 10% that you get to keep. Provided that you eat it in Jerusalem. I've given my 2% to the Kohen. I've given my 10% to the Levite. They don't belong to me anymore. I take another 10% and that's mine. And I take those fruits, I bring it with me to Jerusalem, and when we have the pilgrimage, multiple times a year we go to Jerusalem, I eat my own fruit, my own 
product in Jerusalem. Well, what if it's a lot? It's, you know, how am I going to carry all these bushels of wheat? What you do is you sell the wheat or the grapes or the fruits of whatever type. You sell it in your local town. And that money you bring to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, you buy food. And that food is the second tithing. And the law is that when you convert your crops into money, you have to add a fifth on top of that. And the idea here is, is as follows. The center of Jewish life is the temple. It's Jerusalem. That's where the Sanhedrin is. That's where the seat of our religious life is. Three times a year, we're obligated to go to Jerusalem on the three festivals. Moreover, throughout the year, when we need an inspiration, when we need a little boost, we go to Jerusalem. And by designating 10% of our income to be spent in Jerusalem, that forces us to go to Jerusalem. And when we go there, to have a memorable experience, to buy lots of food and to spend a lot of money even, and to make it as memorable as possible. And therefore, the Torah tells us 10% of your income is a tithe. It's a tithe you don't have to give away. It's yours, you and your family, your children, your household. You eat it in Jerusalem. It is sacred food. You could make it easier by converting it into money and spend the money in Jerusalem. But that's a way to keep the Jewish people connected to keep the Jewish people connected with the rest of their brethren, with the rest of their co-religionists, with the Sanhedrin, which is in Jerusalem, with, with the temple, to make it part of the Jewish way of life. And as a result of that, we'll always be connected to the rest of our people, we'll be connected to Torah, and we'll be united as a nation. That's the second tithe. And then you have what's called the tithe for poor people. And the way this is done is that the Jewish agrarian calendar runs on a seven-year cycle. Every seventh year, we have Shemitah, which is a year that we're not allowed to do any work in the field, and that year we're not obligated on any tithes. So year one and year two, the second tithe is mine, and I eat it in Jerusalem. On year three, I don't have the second tithe go to me to be in Jerusalem, The second tithe is called the tithe of the poor, and I give that 10% to the poor. And then again, four and five, the second tithe is eaten by me and my family in Jerusalem. And year six, instead of the second tithe, we have the tithe for the poor people. It is an interesting question. If two-thirds of the time, that second 10% is eaten by me, and one-third I give to the poor person, why don't we just have it every year, two-thirds of that 10% beaten by me and one-third given to the poor person? It's an interesting question to be ruminated upon. So that's the basic tithing schedule. When you have your 100 bushels of wheat, 2% goes to the Kohen, 10% goes to Levite. Another 10% you have to give away. Who do you give away to? Depends. Year one, two. Four and five, that 10% you have to give it to yourself, provided you eat it in Jerusalem. Once you walk to the city of Jerusalem, you cross over the gate of the city, you can eat it in Jerusalem, provided you are ritually pure. Or you can convert it into money and bring the money to Jerusalem and eat from the food that you buy with that money in Jerusalem. That's year one, two, four and five. Year three, years three and six, I take that 10% and I give it to the poor person and that belongs to the poor person. That's the basic overview of the laws of tithing from a biblical perspective. And mitzvah number 71 is the mitzvah that says we have to follow the pre-designated order. First the Kohen gets his truma, then the Levite gets his tithing, the first tithing. And then the Levite himself has to give 10% of what he got. And then we have the extra 10%, and it depends on what year we're talking about. Years 1, 2, 4, and 5, it's the Meiser Shani, the second tithing, I bring to Jerusalem. 
and years three and six, that 10% goes to the poor person. Now, what is the reason why we have to follow this designated protocol, this sequencing? First you do this, and then you do that. So the Sefer Chinuch says something really interesting. He says, these laws are quite intricate. And the second you start to tamper with it, you're going to make mistakes. And because this is something which is so critical to the upholding of our religion, it's important to do it properly, to follow the pre-designated order, to not tamper with any of the details of this process. I think this is an important lesson for us. You know, with matters of charity, we sometimes like to ballpark things. Well, I don't know, uh, if I take something from the shul or I take something from the charity, well, I'll make up for it, I'll give a little extra next time or something like that. We don't do that. We try to follow protocol to be as precise as possible with matters of charity. Now, the final item here that I want to talk about is what about today? Most of the laws that relate to the land of Israel are applicable only during the times of the temple. We don't have a temple. And therefore, do we have these laws today or not? We do have agriculture in the land of Israel, but we don't have a temple. So it's a huge discussion in the commentaries, but everyone agrees that these laws, in fact, do apply today. The only question is, are these of biblical severity or or are they of rabbinic severity? But everyone agrees that Allah maintains that these laws are still extant today. The problem is, is that we cannot give the truma to the Kohen today or to the Levite. We can't give the tithing to the Levite. And therefore, we have to designate the truma and the maiser, the truma of the various tithes, but we cannot give it to the Kohen. The Kohen cannot eat it when he's ritually pure. The whole idea of purity and impurity is something that is, of course, very foreign to us. But today, we just assume everyone and everything is impure. And therefore, we have to designate it, but we cannot fully implement it, fully actualize it. And therefore, this creates another interesting law with relation to what can we eat and what can we not eat. If you grow fruits or vegetables or grain in the land of Israel, that grain may be identical to the grain you'd grow in Kansas, but one of them will be considered kosher and perfectly edible right away, the one made in Kansas, and one of them will be considered unkosher, inedible, until you separate the truma and the maiser, truma, the various tithes. And ironically, something grown in the land of Israel, we would think, oh, it's holy, it's land of Israel, it's great, support Israeli farmers. Unless the tithing was done, it is considered unkosher. It is like tevel, it's prohibited to be eaten until the tithing has been done. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, I got an email from one of the rabbis in town who said, that there are bell peppers that come from Israel being sold in various United States groceries. And therefore, typically, you know, you look at kosher products, you want to make sure it's got the OU or whatever other kosher symbol that it may have to indicate kosher certification. But the fruits and vegetables, it's, it's all kosher, right? How, it's, there's no, there's no animal products in it. It's kosher. Unless it comes from Israel. If it comes from Israel, it needs certification, and therefore you have to be aware of that as well. Now, my wife told me yesterday when I was researching this, when she was in school in Israel, she was invited by some non-Torah observant family to come for a party by their house. And they said, don't worry about it, everything's going to be 100% kosher. But you can't explain to someone who has no idea of the laws of tithing that, well, you know, your your fruits and vegetables are actually not kosher because it was not certified as being kosher. 
So she had to, she had to research the laws of how to separate the truma, the various tithings herself before she got there. You have to designate part of, let's say, your bowl of strawberries. You have to designate part of it to be considered part of the tithe. And you can't deliver it to the Kohen or the Levite. You have to actually throw it in the garbage. We have to say certain things ahead of time. So she actually did this. She said she went you know, kind of inconspicuously to the kitchen. No one was watching her. So she's able to say the blessing to designate the truma and the maisa, to designate the tithing and to discard of that particular fruit in accordance with the laws of truma maisa, the laws of tithing that are still applicable today. So that is a brief overview of these mitzvahs. We went through five different mitzvahs, the four different tithes that are relevant to the field and the produce, and the fifth mitzvah that we must follow, the proper protocol, do what's first, first, what's second, second, and so on. First the truma to the Kohen, then the first tithing to the Levite, and then the next 10%, it depends. Year one, two, four, and five, it is yours, the second tithing you bring to Jerusalem. Years three and six, that 10% is given to the Ani, to the pauper.